Hello, and welcome to another episode of Solipsist Watched. I'm the Social Solipsist, and on this cold, wintry evening, I decided to watch Tremors from 1990. Uh, Tremors. Where do I, where do I start with Tremors? To be perfectly honest, I can't pinpoint any particular reason why I watched this film other, other than it keeps popping up in various locations, people or videos or things that make reference to it. And I feel like I have to see it. So I watched Tremors. And you know what? I was pleasantly surprised. That's not to say that I wasn't, uh, wasn't expecting anything good. It's not to say I was expecting anything... Uh, anything particularly incredible either. I expected something pretty middle of the road, uh, trending towards the cheap and bad, uh, and I was pleasantly surprised. Now, don't get me wrong. This is no fine work of cinema. I don't think anyone would expect it to be. It's a comedy, horror, thriller, monster film. I mean, it's, it is what it is. It's probably not slated to be great cinema. Um, but you know what? I was pleasantly surprised at, well, I hesitate to say how many things it does well. I guess what I really want to say, and, and that's not to say that it doesn't do some things well. But I think the phrase I want to use here is all the things it doesn't do wrong, which sounds like a backhanded compliment, and it kind of is, but I mean it very genuinely. Because this was made in 1990. It is well into the era of the low-budget horror film. Um, And that spanned decades, of course, but... Especially, uh, you know, in the in the eighties and nineties, in particular, low budget uh, horror films and monster films were just flooding the market. Um, a really run the gamut between, you know, stuff made in a backyard with a you know a VHS camcorder and and that kind of stuff, all the way up to you know multi-million dollar productions that were just bad because nobody was <laughs> nobody was there to check them. Um, and Tre- Tremors is obviously, you know, a... It's, it's low budget. It is fundamentally low budget. The quoted uh, budget was $10 million. And that seems... I, I don't know, about right. Um, it's not... It's, it's not overly ambitious. It doesn't squander its money. There's quite a lot that's done with what they have. Um, and the if I had to describe this film in one word, which is I have to say is a phrase I kind of hate, but I think is very apropos here, it would be economical, both in a monetary sense and in several other ways as well. Um, the story itself is really simple. Uh, and if you've ever heard of this film at all, you probably know what it is. So I don't think it's any spoilers to say, um, some worms, some sandworms show up and terrorize a small town. That's basically the plot. Um, it's fundamentally a monster movie at its core. And I have to compare it to Jaws, which I might remind you came out in, I believe, 1987. Um, or, or rather, uh, not 19... Dyslexia. 1978. Um, I could be wrong on that. Hold on. Seventy-five. It's not seventy-eight. Well, I got it wrong twice. Anyway, you know what I mean. Um, so seventy-five, Jaws came out. Jaws 
was a sensation for a number of reasons, and I won't give you a history of that. That's not what this video is for. However, it was uh, a catalyst for a change and a trend in the movie industry, um, both in the, you know, the uh, AAA movies, big budget movie industry, but also um, in the budget movie industry. Because monster films are, at least in theory, something that can be do it, done relatively inexpensively. Tremors manages to ride the line really well. Where they spent the money where it mattered and not where it didn't. They spent the money on getting a proper effects house to do a lot of practical effects. Uh, animatronics, miniatures puppets, um, all these different things, and it's almost flawless. There's like some, some, you know, there's a few shots here and there that look a little off or where you can see, see things that look a little cheap. The, the, the first one you see, um, in full is quite clearly like cloth draped over a, a frame, but like with that and like maybe two other occasions, it's shockingly high quality. Um, the practical effects, uh, they are very careful about not showing the monsters too much. Uh, they do a lot of threat by proxy which is absolutely the way to do a horror film or a monster film or something like that. Um, because Not only because it saves you money if you don't have to show a lot of really, you know, um, detailed effects all the time, but also because it preserves a state of tension. So when there's just, you know, dirt being moved or uh, gusts of air or whatever the effect is bulging ground those are all cheap things to do relatively speaking to having some you know extraordinary monster effect um, and they're they don't shy away from doing those effects quite frequently uh, there is very little of the movie once the you know, once the inciting incident happens, there are very, there's very few portions of the movie where there, it goes more than a minute or two without a, an indirect, but very overt, um, vision of the, or, or reminder of the threat at hand. Uh, and that really adds to the tension, the sense that this is truly a threat. Um, but that brings me to another point, which I think this does a, a remarkable job of balancing between the balancing the size of the threat, because the threat is fundamentally, objectively not that substantial, but in the eyes of the characters, it is world-ending, and. Neither view is incorrect. And that requires, I think, a deft touch, at the very least in the script, also by in direction and other things as well. But to provide a threat, especially in a monster movie, where it is threatening to any and all characters and um, things that the audience cares about, while simultaneously not getting out of scope, um, it's very commonly, usually not the primary problem, but very commonly a problem with monster films and horror films that the scope of the threat is out of sync with the universe in which it lives, um, where either the, uh, the enemy seems to be completely without you know, any, um, shortcoming until the magical moment when they discover its fault, uh, or the other way where, you know, it's 
doesn't seem to be that much of a threat until it magically needs to exact some some effect on the characters, in which case it suddenly seems to, I don't know, gr- uh, gain a new power just to push the story along. Both of those are common failings in the horror and monster genres, and this film manages to skirt away from both. This is a this is a threat that ex- is existential to the characters, and yet, um, if not for the context of the film and the location and the setting and all that, um, it would be negligible. Um, you know, if there was a, a a military base down the street, it'd be dusted up in a half an hour. But that's not the case. It is extraordinarily extraordinarily economical in its script. Um, in saying or doing what needs to be done, creating an uh, uh, an antagonist that is threatening just to the right point without going over or under, um, and that has a set of abilities that are not overly complicated, do not require extensive exposition or anything else. They don't require particular speculation on the part of the, um, on the part of the characters as to where they came from or what they're capable of. It's simple. They're they like a lot of those things don't matter and they do an extraordinary job of talking about those things as well. The characters discuss where did they come from? Like the, you know, when you have a threat like that, what are, how are the characters going to respond? They're going to wonder, how the hell did this happen? Where did it come from? Sure, they're going to ask those things. And then when the threat's really on them, they're going to throw all that crap out the window and say, I don't know, fuck it. We got to save ourselves. That's what matters right now. And that's done to a T. It's perfect. It's so, so well done. Um, it, the, the end is a bit saccharine and like falls a little bit into some of the pitfalls of the, you know, eighties and nineties low budget films where they feel like they have to have a, a a nice ending, um, that, uh, seems to lose track of the, you know, the scale of, of what happened prior a little bit, uh, to, to give you a feel good, finale but excuse me just a second <coughs> should have gotten some water um it, it's uh what was i saying <laughs> i'm sorry um it's just it's a solid script it's a solid story it does what needs to be done and nothing more it is extraordinarily, again, economical with its setup and payoff. Pretty much, with, um, without exception that I can, can that I can think of, every single scene has a very good reason to exist. Either, either the scene is concluded in a meaningful way by the end of the scene itself, or the scene ends and they return to the same, to an iteration of the same scene um, to pay off what was already set up. And that's not just, you know, that, that is not just the uh, proverbial Chekhov's gun. Um, Some of them, they, they really, there's quite a lot of these sort of setup and payoff things and they really run the, the gamut in terms of their scope little things very little things um are are well paid off as well as you know big scenes um whole shots that are like basically played in reverse later in the film um to say we're you know we're returning to this under different circumstances with greater knowledge and so on and so forth that really build the 
the cohesiveness of the story and the believability of the the movement so to speak of the characters and the story however <laughs> despite all of my praise of it we have some downsides mainly in the acting i i don't want to be a dick but I have never seen Kevin Bacon in a film where he was not garbage. Like a truly awful actor. In, if by some strange happenstance Kevin Bacon ever sees this, I apologize. This is not supposed to be an attack on your character. But I just have not seen any film where he seemed to be properly cast to perform to to deliver a performance that I thought was appropriate and with him being by all accounts the star of this film um especially when you know being juxtaposed by several characters I would say are arguably much much that where the actors are more far more competent and they are far more compelling as characters um it's it's frankly bizarre now bacon's not the only one who's a bad actor in the film there are a number of others there's at least one character i wish was stricken entirely and frankly i'm not sure why they're there um, but does it wholly detract from the film? Any of the above? No, it doesn't. Um, there is some level of charm to Bacon's stilted overacting, uh, that I can appreciate, but it doesn't change the fact that I sort of wish it had been somebody doing it better <laughs> because I think that's one of the primary flaws that didn't doesn't make this a far better film so I made the comparison to Jaws before Jaws is an extraordinary film and this is definitely not on the same level as Jaws but it is 10 times closer to Jaws than it is to the schlock um you know, monster films of the 80s and 90s for the most part. Uh, and it could be pushed quite a bit closer if a few of the actors were better. <laughs> and Bacon just happens to be the most glaring. Um, it also gets a bit more cliched overall, the the plot gets a bit more, or not the plot, but the, the, the beats of the film get a bit more cliched the further you get into the film, where the, like, the last third is, you can basically, I mean, you know, you more or less know what's going to happen before it ever happens. Um, and that's not just, sim that's not just due to simplicity in the film in the filmmaking that's um just you know be it tropes or a little bit too overt in the cinematic beats or whatever uh, there's a, a number of reasons why the the last sort of act of the film um suffers but the first act of the film is particularly extraordinary in its setup of the characters and the relationships for, for not just for the main characters, for everyone involved, pretty much. Um, it's subtle and once again, economical in its delivery of information. Uh, it tells you everything you need to know and none of what you don't. But the reason I'm bringing that up here is that it has one fatal flaw. 
And it's particularly noticeable in that first third, in the first act, um, which is that the pacing is a little bit too fast. It's not that the beats are wrong. It's just it never takes a moment to breathe. And especially in the first act, it desperately needs the opportunity to have that breathe, that breath. Um, it feels hurried from very early on um, when the threats are not yet, do not yet support the level of mania <laughs> being delivered by the pacing. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. Because again, I think that's another thing that would drag it closer to being a, you know, truly extraordinary piece and would not require, not theoretically have required that much more work to get to that point. But yeah, some of the actors are fine. Some of them are, a few are quite good. A few are bad. It's 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 a it's a mixed it's a mixed run and so is the the arc of the film. Um the the set is great, the the you know, the location is very smart um being set in, you know, middle of nowhere Nevada uh is smart. It um delivers all you need to know about the who, where, and why of the film with very little need for actual explanation. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, uh, uh, it's a nice tight composition. Um, and as much, as much as I give a lot of praise to a lot of the practical effects and the um, the careful use of funds for, you know, the things that matter. Um, there are a few aspects here and there in the shot composition and the filming itself, the cinematography and whatnot, um, that in addition to the pacing of the editing early in the film, um, do detract a bit from the film overall. There are quite a number of notable shots that I can think of that are actually extremely good. Um, there are some crane shots that are used quite well. Um, I'm also almost surprised. I was almost, well, I was surprised. In retrospect, I'm almost surprised just how many there were. Um, I, in watching it, I was surprised that there were any at all, um, and that they were done well. It wasn't just a crane shot for the sake of a crane shot. Um, there's some decent cutting of, uh, you know, of various action scenes to, um, carefully assemble a scene without, you know, um, showing the seams, so to speak in, in the composition between, you know, th there are very few shots uh, where the threat and the characters are on screen at the same time. Um, and the fact that that's not more noticeable is a credit to the edit and to the, to the cinematography. However, there are more than a few shots that also go the other way. Not that they're particularly egregiously bad, but just that they're not not particularly great. Framing is weird, or lighting's a bit off, or um, just they're a little excessive in movement or shaky cam or a few things like that. Um, oh, there was one particular shot actually on the on the positive side I don't actually remember where in the film it was that has a pretty uh, a pretty impressive camera move 
that I think has got to be probably like a 270 degree rotation um, with like a whole angling thing. And it's, it's really well done. I wish I'd made more close note of it. There's some good stuff and there's some bad stuff in there is what I'm getting at basically. <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah, that's my, my ramblings for the most part. Um, if this is up your alley at all and you haven't seen it yet, I do definitely recommend watching it. Um, you're not getting some great piece of cinema, but uh, it's a worthwhile... It's a worthwhile thing to watch. Um, Yeah. Don't regret it at all. Anyway, uh, before I keep rambling, I'll sign off here. Thank you guys for watching another episode of Solipsist Watched. I am the Social Solipsist, and I will see you guys next time.